You're listening to the Banana Data Podcast, a podcast hosted by Data IQ. I'm Trevaney. And I'm Will. And we'll be taking you behind the curtain of the AI hype, exploring what it is and what it isn't capable of. This episode, we talk about catching AI in the act of cheating and ask, what does it mean to be a successful AI company? Hey, Will. Hey, Trevaney, what's up? It's our one year anniversary of Banana wow. Data. Yeah. One year down. How many to go? I mean, I infinity. Can we just upload our minds to the AI cloud and do this into infinity? I like it. So let's do it. Okay. So today we have some fun content to review. And I wanted to start with this article I read called Specification Gaming, the flip side of AI ingenuity. And it's really cool because it actually relates back to this concept that I love to talk about, which is governing the optimizations of your AI, right? So what's the point here? Basically, the authors are arguing that we see a lot more AI coming out that is really good at getting you to an end goal, but not actually in the way that you want to get there. So the example here is with like robots that are supposed to do some task, like pick up a block and put it on another block. But the rules say in order to have successfully completed this, the red block needs to be higher than the blue block, right? Or the, okay. the bottom of the red block needs to be higher than the blue block. So instead of picking up the red and putting it on top of the blue, the robots are just flipping over the red block because of the way it's shaped, it ends up being higher. Te so technically it's correct, which is the best kind of correct. According to the rules specified. Yeah, according to the, like, the right. desired outcome, the desired yeah. result. And so because they haven't been optimized or because they've like created these like very specific rules of desired result, the actual algorithm is doing what it can to get there faster and more efficiently, even if that's not actually the human intended outcome. Okay, right, yeah. So the article makes reference to King Midas and the relevance there, right? So King Midas said, like, I want everything I touch turned to gold. This is going to be great. I'm going to have the result that I want, which is to be fabulously wealthy. And then obviously we know what happens to King Midas. It's not so good when everything you touch turns to gold. So here I think you're saying that the result that they wanted was the block to be higher. But I like this article too and this idea too because it's a theme of our podcast, but one that we haven't explicitly touched upon previously, which is like, you need to be really, and this is why I was drawn to math way back when, is you have to be really rigorous in how you define things and how you set up the problem. So in this case, you can't just say, oh, I want the red block to be higher than the blue block. Like how exactly, and in what ways do you want the red block to be higher? What's ultimately the goal? Don't just be lazy about it. I think that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So they talk about this spectrum of unseen outcomes. So if you make a new algorithm or you, you, know, you design a new system, there are going to be things that you don't know what this AI is going to do. And some of that stuff can be really exciting and innovative. They talk about AlphaGo and the program being able to innovate and do something that was totally unexpected. But then on the other hand, you have things like this robot block. And I think there are applications even in traditional AI or the kind of AI that you and I interact with more frequently. They give an example of these x-rays that were used to train an algorithm to detect pneumonia. So the researchers built this deep learning model, but when they went to apply it to new data, it turns out the prediction of whether or not an image contained pneumonia was based on whether or not the picture was taken on a certain x-ray machine because the algorithm figured out that certain machines were used for sicker patients. And so we're more likely to have pneumonia. So we call that data leakage, right, as data scientists, but it is a similar problem as this specification, right? If you don't specify that, go and get me this answer based on what little information you have and not, you know, uncovering other things, then we're, we're not going to be able to optimize for the actual outcome we want. Yeah. And this makes me have faith in the future of humanity because Going back to the AlphaGo example, I think what's so exciting about AI and using that term not lightly, like talking about it in the, the most highfalutin sense, artificial intelligence, is not just that it can necessarily solve problems, but I think we've seen this with algorithms that have optimized for chess performance as well. Humans will watch the, the robot, let's call it a robot. Humans will watch the AI or the robot make moves 
And then after it's won, they'll reflect on the game and be like, wow, it seems like this robot is employing a strategy, right? It's clearly, it has like a set of steps and the expected response in mind. And it's very sophisticated and no human has ever really come up with that. And that's like the beauty and the promise of all of this is that we kind of create some, again, this is a loaded term, but a sentient being, right? It's, it's kind of like thinking in the way that a human chess player puts together and pieces together a strategy. And that's great. But the reason why I'm saying I'm optimistic for humans is it's still a lot of work to, to the point of this article, clearly, rigorously, and thoughtfully specify kind of all the constraints, all the goals, all the edge cases. And once you've got the problem set up, then you can click that big red go button and watch it work. They talk about this as well from the other side, which is to say that what happens if AI becomes good enough to exploit flaws in a system rather than alerting you to those flaws? It's like the vision, like the fear of super intelligence. Like if I have an AI system that's meant to maximize like the click rate on my emails, right? So I'm sending out marketing emails and I want them to have a high click rate. Like what will a super intelligent system do? It's just like set up a bunch of shadow fake email accounts and like use APIs and send all the emails to those accounts that it created and open every single one. And it's like, hey, look, we got 100% open rate, Will. Yeah, and so I think the question is, can we design algorithms or AI that sees a flaw and says, hey, we need to correct it? Or are we necessarily going towards AI that's going to see a flaw and continue to exploit it? And I think that's then their second point is that keeping humans in the process is important because not only for this checking for flaws and all of that, but also because sometimes the reward or the expected goal isn't just, you know, a prediction of X or Y. It's the actual process itself too that has to matter. This reminds me of a conversation we had on the podcast a long time ago with Dan Schiebler from Twitter, where we talked about important data leadership. And so there the conversation was about, you know, what are good data projects to pursue? Like what's a viable data project? But in this case, with regards to specification gaming, I think similarly, like good data leadership is important, right? Because you can't just have some global policy, like make the red brick higher than the blue brick because it won't actually work when you let the AI systems run. And like more realistically, if I'm a business leader and I say, hey, I just want to maximize my company's profit, that's not a good goal with which to program an AI for a variety of reasons. But one reason why it's a bad goal with which to program an AI is because you're going to get specification gaming. It's not going to turn out the way you like. And realistically, it's not even feasible. You can't tell an AI system to maximize your company's revenue. What you can do is build sub AI systems that do things like optimize your click-through rate on your online advertisements and optimize your email open rates. And these can be like minor strategies that you optimize for in pursuit of some more global company-wide strategy. Can you elaborate on that a little more? I, th I think I get what you're saying. I was saying like, if you had an AI that could just like solve this massive problem, like revenue maximization, we would need to govern it because it would do evil things, right? It'd be like, oh, well, I can abuse the environment and that will maximize revenue, but that's all I care about. It's my reward function. So if we had the evil AI, we would have to govern it, but we don't have that. So we don't need to worry about it yet. But what we do need are leaders who can make intelligent choices about parceling up this big task, which is something like maximize revenue or maximize customer engagement or maximize good that I'm doing in the world and be like, well, what does it mean to do good in the world as my nonprofit? Or what does it mean to maximize revenue? Or how do I maximize revenue? I do it in these specific ways. And then I train or I acquire AI algorithms that can help me in each of those specific ways. Okay, so this might be contentious, but just because it's not evil AI doing this maximizing of revenue doesn't mean that there aren't still very questionable and shady practices happening all over the world. And so I don't think that you can say that just because it's a human governing it, it automatically means less governance. I think humans can still take advantage of AI in a way that is not good or is optimized for the wrong thing, which does cause more, more harm. I don't think you get away from the, the specification problem by taking it out of AI and putting it into humans, I think you make it worse when you put it into humans. But I'm not talking about it from a moral perspective. I'm just talking about it from like an efficacy perspective. Like if you have one big goal you're trying to solve for, you need to like break it down into sub goals, which humans oversee, and then you use AI to pursue those. And you're right, yeah. like you could, humans could make evil choices every step along the way. But like practically speaking, 
you need a human to say, let's optimize for the smaller local process. And we can or cannot use AI to help. But then once we like master all these small processes, like our marketing and like our product development, and once all these things are good, then kind of the cohesive picture, which is company success, will take care of itself. But you still need to govern those AIs. You can't say that like, don't worry, it's broken down small enough that we don't need to worry about optimizing it. I think the point is that you as a human, you can specify the reward function to be small enough that you're like, if we get this optimization right, if I've constrained the problem enough that like the AI can't move but so far, the, you know, the possible strategies of the AI are so limited that it's going to do like really what I want it to do. It's not going to pull some cheap move like flipping the blocks. It's actually going to solve the problem of moving the blocks the way I want the blocks to move. And so I like specify all these small, clean problems. The AI system actually performs the way I want it to. My thesis is that's the job of the human is to like do the important human work of specifying the problem. And it's not trivial and you might get it wrong, but you just need to give good thought to it. Yeah. So it's more than just like the leader specifying the output correctly, but really also about the entire design process. Because if you're not designing with the actual goal in mind, then it doesn't really matter what the goal is set as. So therefore you, you want, which is, it sounds really buzzy, but it seems potentially true, both a bottom up and a top down approach. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So no, you want to think yeah. like globally, what's the ultimate thing we want to happen? That's the top down. But then I know that again, because of specification gaming, to use the term in this blog post, if I just start with the top down approach, I'm going to have an AI system that sorts of cheats or I'm going to have other kind of issues with my mechanism design along the way. And I'm not ultimately going to get the solution I want. I'm going to get some like haphazard solution. So I need to think bottom up, like how can I specify this problem, make it small, make it tractable, build minor solutions, which in some combine to reach my global solution. So I think at the end of the day, what this comes down to is properly governing, not only, you know, the AI for ethical or responsible AI reasons, but also governing optimizations so that we know that what we're asking an AI program to do is actually what we're getting out. Now it's time for my favorite part of the show where we explain complex data science topics in plain English. So Tarani, could you please explain YOLO to me? Okay, contrary to popular belief, YOLO does not stand for You Only Live Once, the Drake song. In fact, it is You Only Look Once. It is a deep learning algorithm that can train and execute models for image recognition about four times faster than other traditional models. And it does so by only looking at the image one time. And that's where the name you only look once comes from. Essentially, the model is able to see the entire picture and separate objects in the picture into various bounding boxes. It then can run parallel classifications on those many images within the larger image and output predictions. So its main application is in real-time object detection, especially when you have a lot of background noise or um, many objects in the same frame. It can pretty quickly and efficiently pick out the different parts of an image. So next time you're running your image recognition, Will, what are you going to do? YOLO. We got it. So transitioning from our previous discussion, kind of staying with this idea of humans in the loop and edge cases and whether your AI is really doing what you want it to do and whether it's performant enough. I read this article recently from Andreessen Horowitz, which is called The New Business of AI and How It's Different from Traditional Software. So obviously, Andreessen Horowitz, a VC, this is kind of talking about companies and company finance from that angle, thinking about fundraising and the like. But that's not typically something we focus on. I don't think we'll focus on it so much here today, though I do think the article brings up a lot of interesting considerations for really anyone in the data space, whether you're working with data, whether you're an organization that works with data, whether you're an old enterprise or a new startup. So I wanted to talk with you about that today, Jermaine. Yeah, I thought this was a really unique take on how AI is developing and what that means, not only as, you know, us as consumers of AI, but even the companies themselves who are AI companies and, you know, what that means and what that means moving forward. I guess the first question I really had though here was what 
is an AI company? You know, we've asked ourselves, do I do AI? But in this, in this piece, you know, the authors are talking a lot about AI companies, you know, in quotes. And I have no idea really what that means. I think it's a great question and one that I would like to discuss with you. I think the only thing, the only hints I see them giving are that they say, you know, that AI companies are some amalgam of software companies and services companies. So again, just because maybe our listeners don't think about these things terribly often, right? The description that they give of a software company is, hey, a software company is typically characterized by recurring revenue streams and high gross margins. Whereas a services business, you're not having recurring revenue, you just sell a project once and that project has lower margins associated with it. So what the hell does this all mean? If you think about like salesforce.com, right? Salesforce makes some intellectual property. They make some software, they ship it to Trevanian Co. And they ship it to Anand Co. And they ship it to Chloe and Co. And it only costs them to build it once, but they just got revenue from the three of your companies. And also they signed you up on a recurring basis. So every year you have to pay them a little bit more money. You know, maybe they never even change the software again. That's kind of the software model, right? You with me so far? Right. Yeah. So, but then how does AI come in? Well, so we'll get there just like to reiterate again for listeners. So the services model, think about something like someone like McKinsey, right? McKinsey comes in and says, Hey, we're going to revolutionize this business process for you. These are all the things we're going to do. They do a project. They put in a lot of man, woman hours into that project. Then it's over. The company's very happy and they leave. So it's not recurring. There's kind of more labor that has to go into the execution of the project. It's very labor intensive. This is a services engagement. And so they're saying AI, it's like not just straight up software, but rather it's somewhere in between. I mean, I guess by that logic, the only AI companies are those that are providing some kind of custom software plus services. And I would argue that what makes an AI company is bigger than that, right? It's not just the software that's unique or or the service that's unique, but it is also the fact that AI or some sort of decision science or machine learning is underpinning the offering itself. I think that's exactly right. I think that, you know, my limited Googling of like what people think of as an AI company, right? No one has an agreement on this. I think any company that's using data could say, oh, we're an AI company. But realistically, when I think of an AI company, I agree with you. I think of a company that somehow in its core offering or its core product, AI, machine learning, fundamentally a part of that. So that's what I think of as an AI company. But when they say that AI companies are software plus services. The way that the authors of this article frame it is that if you think about something like Tinder, right? So Tinder is an application mm-hmm. that I think is using a lot of AI under the hood to figure out who I like, right? On the swipe right, swipe left, one of these swiping apps. In this case, AI is very much core to the product experience. And so they're saying that, yeah, it's, it's an app. It is software, but the services component of this AI company, it's the fact that retraining these models and making sure your machine learning models kind of work equally well for all customers or consumers, that's a challenge. And that level of human input on the side of the company like Tinder, that's similar to the effort that services companies have to put in. You can't just ship it once and forget it. You have to keep monitoring your AI and your AI product and make sure that it's continuing to perform up to snuff. The service component is that you constantly have to be putting in labor to monitor and maintain your AI application. So it's not like Tinder, like has some people who are calling me up being like, Will, are you happy with your Tinder experience? Like not services in that regard, but services and the fact that they have continually people working on the product and working on the customer relations. So an AI company then is one that not only provides some kind of software, but also a service in the sense of making sure that things are going the way that you expect it to or improving to keep customer needs at the forefront, which is different, you know, markedly different than traditional business, which has been sort of a one and done or more of a services oriented model that's only about human interaction. I think that all makes sense. But what I'm interested in more of, I guess, is given that we have these new types of business, right? The AI company, how do these companies judge themselves now? What standards do they hold themselves to, especially given that they're pushing the boundaries of a new sort of economic model? So to that point, and again, if you're starting up an AI company, oftentimes, particularly if you're working like B2B, another point the authors make is that you might judge your success and say, hey, we have some sort of AI solution. And that AI solution works for a few core enterprise products. So you go out and basically 
the data you're getting from like Coca-Cola, who's a client, is similar to the data that you're getting from PepsiCo, who's a client. And so like now you've got two huge clients, life is good. You've got some algorithm that works in the soda business. It works from the data you're getting from your two big clients in the soda business. And so to some extent, Trebani, to answer your question, I think that how they measure success is if the algorithms, if the AI they're producing kind of resonates with their clients. But then I think, again, to how this is different and how AI can be so difficult is that just because it works for Pepsi's data and just because it works for Coke's data doesn't mean it works for all other beverage companies' data. So every time you get a new client and they're like, okay, here's our data, show us how your algorithm solves our problems. It might be that there's something structurally different about their data. As you know, Trevaney is a data scientist, maybe just the actual format of their data is wonky and this company has to put in time to kind of reformat the data to make it compatible with algorithms. All this massaging has to go on to uh, make data play nicely with AI so that this company can succeed, which I think is definitely resonates with me having worked in this space and it's definitely difficult and frustrating. The interesting thing here is that edge cases. So as a data scientist, as a developer, we deal with edge cases all the time where you've built something that it works generally, but then there's like these one or two things that are just off. And I think the argument they're they're making here is that as a AI company grows, the edge cases are necessarily going to grow only because you're expanding to new types of clients, new types of industries, whatever it might be. And as a result, your overarching model or overarching software isn't going to be able to address everybody's needs. So for them, and I think they, they rightly state this, the best way to avoid some of that edge case complexity is to reduce your complexity overall in your modeling and in your platform, whatever you're developing, so that it is more easier to iterate upon. The idea of kind of having a parsimonious model, like making a simple model that's robust and works across many different use cases, I think is a good point. Another one, though, to solve this concept of edge cases, which I think is ironic that a lot of people don't always appreciate is that if you have edge cases or if you just have a hard AI problem you're trying to solve for, you know, one way in which companies are solving this problem currently is they still have a lot of humans who are working as human intelligence that's you know, masquerading as artificial intelligence. So again, going back to the, the Tinder example, you know, even though maybe I think it's just some artificial intelligence, maybe there's actually some person there saying like, okay, we'll just log on to the platform. So-and-so else just logged on to the platform. Like, they seem like a good match. And maybe actually it's human intelligence that's making that match under the hood because they don't rely enough on the AI, because the AI system is not strong enough or because there's too many edge cases, which to the point of the article, like that makes AI companies unique, harder to scale, kind of harder to run than your traditional software company. Right. But then at the same time, you can use that human plus AI combo as a selling point, right? They also argue that you should be embracing the services side of your AI. I think that's right. Just this concept, which has nothing to do with AI, but just if you're an organization of any kind, like owning who you truly are. So in this case, instead of saying like, oh, we scan your receipts and some magical algorithm does all this work behind the scenes, be like, no, we actually have some people in a room who are reading your receipts, but like, that's a value add because those people are really going to contribute to your experience. Right. So you want to make sure that you are going to have changes in your tech stack and every day something new is going to emerge. So while it's good to be able to offer sort of a unique product from the get go, the better way to move forward is to make sure that what you're building on top of that is not only sustainable, but grounded in a foundation that is reliable and not just the latest thing. So on that point, I have a question for you. If I am an organization that's building an AI product, right? So maybe I, you know, scan x-rays and try to ascertain whether or not this person has pneumonia. Trevani, should I be using kind of at root in my company's software stack? Should the AI model, which I obviously might adapt with transfer learning or with, you know, some customization with my data scientists, but should that AI model at its core be built off of an open source model or should it be fully built by my organization from the ground up? Well, I think a majority of AI applications are going to start with open source. Unless you plan to hire a bunch of people to and you know buy like 15 GPUs to train your own new neural network, you're going to want to start with something that's come before. But then what makes it yours is the iteration on top of that, right? That's what makes it proprietary. That's what makes it unique to what you're offering. 
I don't think this means that you should stay away from open source. I just think you should recognize that it's what you have today might not be there tomorrow. So what you need to do is have a tech stack that can adapt to that changing ecosystem. Yeah, I think one issue here, though, I mean, maybe it's an issue depending on your perspective, is if I'm a company and, you know, I think on this podcast, we have a staunch record of thinking about more than just profit optimization, which I'm proud of. However, if I'm a company that's starting up and my core AI company is based on a model that's been open sourced by Google, I think just to really emphasize the point you just made, that's risky, right? Because then you could come along, you could take that model from Google and you can kind of build a similar company on top of that model as well. You could start competing with me like tomorrow. So again, I don't think it's a problem. In fact, it's potentially an opportunity, but it's interesting for kind of AI company founders or even enterprise companies that are starting to incorporate AI into their products. Because so much progress in AI is open source, it's done in academia, anybody can access these algorithms. Like really the differentiators are the customer service, like what other things are you doing to increase your brand, to increase your customer satisfaction? Because at the end of the day, everybody can pull down kind of the best in class algorithm from the Allen Institute and go forth and kind of start a competitive company. Right. Yeah. The AI itself is not the surprising thing anymore in that our underlying algorithms might all be very similar, but what we've built on top of that and what we're doing to make that more accessible is where the advantage comes in. Okay, so it's time for the brain teaser portion of the episode before we head out. And as always, the answer to last week's brain teaser is in the show notes so that we're not spoiling it for anyone here. Imagine with me, if you will, my friend Gary. Gary is peeling a pile of potatoes. There are 44 in total. He can peel three a minute and his friend Christian joins him four minutes later and is peeling five a minute. How many does each person peel? Wait. You don't mean banana peels? That's all we've got for today in the world of banana data. We'll be back with another podcast in two weeks. But in the meantime, subscribe to the banana data newsletter to read these articles and more like them. We've got links for all the articles we discussed today in the show notes. All right. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure, Tavani. It's been great, Will. See you next time. <laughs>